Okay, I'm gonna give it off to Lena here to uh, welcome Dario. Dario, we're looking forward to your talk today. Um, good morning. Uh, it is an absolute pleasure to introduce our guest speaker today, Dr. Dario Englot. If you can go to the next slide, please. Um, Dr. Englot obtained his PhD in neurosciences and MD from Yale University. He completed his neurosurgical training at UCSF and then fellowship in epilepsy and functional neurosurgery at Vanderbilt University. He is currently an assistant professor of neurosurgery, biomedical engineering, radiology, electrical engineering, neurology at Vanderbilt. Um, he has made significant contributions to the field of functional neurosurgery, as you can see here from a few selected publications, and the high impact of his work is clear. He has published over 140 manuscripts with over 6,355 citations and an H index of 45. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Englot, welcome. Thank you. I really appreciate uh, you having me. Thank you, Dr. Q, Dr. Grewal. This has been an honor to get this invitation, and it's also incredible just to see you know, how, mu how much this department has grown under Dr. Q's leadership, both clinically, but also with re incredible research uh, initiatives that have been coming out. The publications I've been following are just uh, you know, amazing that to see also across social media. You, you guys are really excellent in your communication, both I can see on social media, but even in this Grand Rounds presentation, the organization of showing everybody's accomplishments is just uh, outstanding to see. So it's really an honor to, to be invited. So let me... And Dario, I was going to, as you're putting your presentation, I just want to welcome you on behalf of the entire, yes. you know, uh, team right here. You can see many faces from all around the world, from many countries, our team right here. We're so excited to having to learn from you. We want to figure out a way to build more bridges, learn from you. I know that you and I train in the same place. The whole right. concept of the 645 case, right. you know, they're all that I took that out of UCSF. You remember that. And I of know course. that tradition has continued. And we're just so excited to have you. And uh, in, in some ways, you and I are siblings, basically, in, in the way that we train. So we, I'm very proud of all your accomplishments. And I look forward to learning from you this morning and beyond this morning. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Alfredo. Oh, here to coming from you, that means so much to me. So thank you so much for those words and for having me today. Are you able to see the slide? Yes. Okay, great. So this is my talk. It's going to be talk about an engineering approach to improving our surgical treatment of, uh, of epilepsy. And I've been uh, building a human uh, a, um, engineering lab here, uh, basically focused a lot on epilepsy, but also helping us understand normal consciousness and cognitive networks and, and using seizures as a model to see how they implicate different brain regions and then understanding those brain regions better. Thinking about epilepsy, as we know, as a neurosurgical group, patients with well-localized and drug-resistant epilepsy can become seizure-free with certain epilepsy surgeries. And I think that's incredibly important because uh, it's an extremely comorbid disease with seizure freedom being the greatest predictor of quality of life in, in epilepsy. Most of the epilepsy that we think about in neurosurgery is focal epilepsy, and um, it's presumed that seizures originate from a discrete focus, but there's something we're missing in our typical approach to focal epilepsy. Our clinical localization tools are clearly imperfect and our planning tools are imperfect. We collect our history and, we, and analyze semiology we do neuroimaging studies to look for a lesion and in intracranial EEG or scalp EEG, try to find where seizures are originating. And still the seizure freedom rates are, are suboptimal. So there's, so there's something that we're missing when we don't pay attention to brain networks in determining the best way to analyze and treat epilepsy. So some of those questions that we'll talk about today are how can brain connectivity analyses better define the, are certain patient subgroups and better delineate seizure networks to help us make the best surgical decisions in epilepsy. Also, patients with epilepsy have profound neurocognitive effects and deficits that, that worsen over time. And how can our connectivity and network analyses help us understand those so we can devise better treatments? And then finally, our goal with epilepsy surgery is to stop the seizures. Uh, does that actually have an implication to, on brain networks? Can brain network connectivity problems in epilepsy uh, improve if we are able to stop seizures with surgery? So this is just a little flow chart of how can the um, network studies that we're doing improve surgical care? 
we do a standard pre non-invasive evaluation in our patients. And currently about half of the time, we think we're confident where seizures are coming from and we go to a resection or other uh, neuromodulation uh, treatment. And about 50% of patients will achieve long-term seizure freedom, higher in temporal lobe epilepsy, but it's far from uh, ideal. Another half of patients were still not clear after non-invasive evaluation, and we go to intracranial EEG, which today is mostly uh, called stereo EEG, keep the patients in the hospital a couple weeks, and then we, this, we hopefully are confident that then where the seizures are originating and we go to surgery, but still the, the outcomes are suboptimal, and there's several patients who continue to have seizures. And in addition to that, there's sometimes cases that even after intracranial EEG were unclear about the localization, and we may not even be able to, to proceed to surgery. How can MRI non-invasive connectivity analyses help this? Well, they can improve our confident localization rate. They can improve our ability to understand the brain networks underlying this epilepsy and pick the best decision. Um, and we can avoid intracranial EEG in many patients and, uh, and proceed to surgery with just non-invasive traditional and connectivity analyses. And it, even when we have to proceed to intracranial EEG, that we can do further connectivity analyses on those intracranial signals that can improve our confident localization and improve our seizure freedom rate after surgery. So we can incorporate brain network analyses into our clinical pipeline to improve this treatment of uh, this disorder. What do I mean when I talk about brain connectivity? Well, I break it up in my own mind into a few simple categories such as structural, functional, and effective connectivity. Structural connectivity is really the examination of those structural axonal connections that connect the different brain regions. So those white matter connections, and I think about these as the physical highways connecting the, the different regions of the brain. Whereas functional connectivity, here we're using statistical techniques to see how brain regions are talking to each other. And we examine how related the neural signals in different areas are to infer how much those are functionally connected, the gray matter regions. And this is really the traffic on the highways. And as you know, you can have a, a large physical highway that has very sparse traffic in the middle of the night, or you could have a small road that's jammed with traffic. And so structural and functional connectivity are not always directly uh, correlated. Effective connectivity is functional connectivity, but adding in the traffic direction. So which way we functional connectivity sets this region and this region are highly functionally connected and effective connectivity will say, well, it's region A talking more to region B rather than the vice versa. Temporal lobe epilepsy is the most common epilepsy syndrome and it's the one we see the most as surgeons, but some diagnosis can be challenging oftentimes even just lateralizing which side the seizures are coming from in a patient with classic temporal lobe epilepsy semiology is tough if we don't clearly see mesial temporal sclerosis or another lesion on the MRI. The reasons for this are seizures very quickly spread from one temporal lobe to the other temporal lobe on scalp EEG. Patients are often have bilateral temporal lobe seizures and that you may not be able to capture even with a prolonged uh, hospital stay. And um, sometimes even a slam dunk case, mesial temporal sclerosis, um, concordant PET and semiology and EEG, Sometimes these patients still have uh, seizures after surgery. Is there something different about their brain network that's, that we're not determining on just our classic clinical studies? And then also there's this now becoming a case of maybe overkill SEEG. Now that we can do intracranial recordings without requiring a craniotomy for grid, are we throwing this at patients that would otherwise be uh, able to go right to surgery without... Um, without intracranial monitoring. And so our, that's our goal with these connectivity analyses in temporal lobe epilepsy is to start to address these challenges. We're using both uh, data-driven and hypothesis-driven approaches across our studies. This is more of a data-driven machine learning study, an example of an MD-PhD student, Graham Johnson, where basically we are taking features of the T1 and the diffusion-weighted MRI scan and looking at creating maps throughout the brain of, fact, of fractional anisotropy and structural connectivity and seeing if we can detect features that parse, that uh, separate different patient groups, patients from controls, left versus right, good outcome versus bad outcome. And by extracting these features with uh, ICA analysis and then identifying different decoding networks, we can identify which networks across the brain using the machine learning approach 
are most likely to stratify and predict different patient subgroups. And this is, will su help supplement our traditional analysis of the imaging looking for lesions. By doing this, we can create different ICA loadings and label the different patient subgroups and then create uh, receiver operated curves, uh, characteristic curves to help uh, predict an, on an individual patient. Is this patient in category A, such as unilateral temporal lobe seizures or category B, they have a propensity for bilateral seizures and help us supplement our, our um, clinical uh, pipeline. And so this, in this study, we were able to, we focused on temporal lobe epilepsy with current uh, other studies looking at neocortical epilepsy. But we, we tried to make different decisions with the machine learning algorithms. Can we stratify patients and controls, bilateral versus unilateral, left versus right, and patients who will go on to be seizure-free versus those who will not be seizure free. And here's just an example of how that works. Uh, here's a prediction of left versus right temporal lobe epilepsy, where we create this decoding network and then lead to these ICA loadings. And we're able to find connections that very clearly distinguish patients with left or right temporal lobe epilepsy, even if their MRI doesn't show a visible lesion that we can see. And then we can create um, these ROC curves to help on an individual basis for the next patient uh, predict which, the laterality of their epilepsy. Here's an example of outcomes. So this one is looking at right temporal lobe epilepsy patients, those who become seizure-free versus those who have persistent seizures. And we can do the similar analysis. I'd create these uh, machine learning approach to, to um, uh, uncover these ICA loadings. And we will find connections that clearly distinguish the patients who will be seizure-free successfully after surgery versus those that aren't. Now, you know, the, a problem with these data-driven machine learning approaches, though, is that it's kind of a black box. You know, you, you, the, you, the computer tells you, well, the, okay, we found a pattern, but what exactly is that pattern and how does that help us understand the biology of the disease? So that's an issue here. So in this study, we took this one step further and we did uh, community detection analysis to try to identify very small subnetworks of the regions where the connections are specifically driving these predictions. So rather than just looking at the entire brain, can we identify a very small subnetwork to help guide this decision and that and understand the biology of which regions and which connections are helping distinguish different patient subgroups. So for example, here's an example of left temporal lobe epilepsy. Patients who we all, we went to surgery for left temporal lobe epilepsy based on clinical criteria, some of them were seizure-free, some of them weren't seizure-free. And we did our full network analysis, which had a favorable uh, area under the curve to predict whether they were going to be seizure-free or not. But it, that was kind of a black box. If we apply community detection analysis, we can uncover some very specific connections, particularly the, some subcortical connections in thalamus and putamen, as well as some extra temporal connections in the occipital and parietal lobe that show us when they are abnormal, uh, they, this patient is uh, likely to not have seizure, not go on to be seizure free. And so what this can do is help us look at specific connections that we need to focus on to take a step back in this patient. So, well, we, you know, we think this patient is, is a good candidate for surgery, but this analysis tells us they may not do very well. And this small uh, sub decoding subnetwork with just a few regions as a uh, performs almost as well as the entire the entire network. Another example, right temporal lobe epilepsy, is a similar story. So that's a, a, um, a data-driven uh, diffusion-weighted imaging study. Here's more of a hypothesis-driven functional MRI. So the default mode network is a series of regions in the brain that are uh, highly active during the awake resting state when we're not performing a task. And the default mode network connectivity has been shown to be particularly abnormal in temporal lobe epilepsy patients. And we're starting to understand the co potential cognitive implications that can have. One study we found is that the con connectivity between the hippocampus and the default mode network can significantly um, predict a patients that have right versus left temporal lobe epilepsy, even in those patients with, where uh, their clinical tests are discordant and, and not able to, to clearly uh, distinguish that. We looked at several different resting state networks, such as salience network, uh, central executive network, visual network. None of these other networks 
uh, show different connectivity patterns with mesial structures that can predict whether a patient has left versus right epilepsy. But the default mode network connectivity with the mesial structures is very predictive. And that's one thing, a hypothesis that we tested and confirmed in about 52 TLE patients versus controls. This is postdoc Buma, an MD-PhD student, uh, Hernan Gonzalez. We, you can take this a step further and do network-based statistics to help uncover which network is most responsible for these predictions, distinguishing right versus left temporal lobe epilepsy patients. And we find it's really mostly driven by hippocampus to ipsilateral structures in the default mode network, such as precuneus, inferior parietal, the lateral orbital frontal cortex, and, um, and then medial orbital frontal cortex are the, are the structures that are seem to be have very different functional connections in the left versus right patients. So this is another thing that we can say, well, let's, let's get this uh, network study on these patients before as part of our clinical workup to help us drive our clinical decisions. In this study, we also used a, a, a technique called dynamic causal modeling. As I said, remember functional connectivity doesn't tell us the direction of the connections. This is a measure that can tell us the direction, the effective connectivity, which regions are, are talking to which regions. We create several different models to apply, and then we test the patients in the models. And what we found in this study is that it seems to be the inward connectivity from the left versus right side that, that is characteristic of right mesial temporal lobe epilepsy and right versus left side characteristic of left temporal lobe epilepsy. So the inward functional connections, the directional connections seem to be towards the epileptogenic side. So this is another measure that we can start to use to help predict you know, you know, which region set, uh, seizures are coming from using functional connectivity studies. Okay, so moving on to the, some of our intracranial EEG studies. Now, as we said, about 50% of patients, even after non-invasive studies, still we are not completely confident about the localization. And we go to intracranial monitoring, which is today is using stereo EEG, where we place multiple depth electrodes into the brain, and we have the patient stay for a couple of weeks in the hospital, and we do multiple interventions to have them have seizures, reduce medications, stay up late at night, eat flashing lights, even brain stimulation. And so th this is, um, it's, an it's a minimally invasive, but still invasive uh, technique. We use a few techniques, a few methods, both robot guided and 3D printed frame uh, at our institution. There are downsides to this and limitations. First of all, even with intracranial EEG, the ictal interpretation is not always easy or accurate. It can be difficult to discern seizure onset zones versus early propagation of seizures. And, uh, and we even then, our, our uh, localization for surgical decisions is not perfect. Also, these interventions that we do to create seizures are often create seizures that are atypical compared to the seizures that the patients have in their home setting, in their normal environment, on their medications, and that can mislead us in uh, guiding our surgical decisions. Also, this is not enough time to capture patients who have bilateral seizures. Uh, uh, over a third of patients with bilateral temporal lobe epilepsy will go what, one month before they de demonstrate seizures from the less common side. And so we can miss patients who have secondary seizures coming from the contralateral side with this um, approach and they'll continue to have seizures after surgery because of that. And also it seems a little bit archaic for us to be forcing patients to have seizures just so we can localize them. So what would be a better way? You know, what if we could do a network-based single day analysis of intracranial signals without waiting medications, without having to create seizures that can help us predict which regions need to be treated and where the seizures will originate and which regions don't need to be treated and improve upon our clinical pipeline for intracranial EEG analysis. This is a study a couple years ago by grad students, Sarah Gudeo and Hernan Gonzalez. What they noticed is that a certain connectivity measure called imaginary coherence, which allows us to measure how brain regions are talking to each other, seemed to be very high in regions that ultimately go on to create seizures uh, and much lower in regions that don't go on to create seizures. So this is an example patient who had these regions of the brain sampled with SEEG and the left precentral gyrus had very high functional connectivity compared to other regions. And ultimately that's where the seizures were coming from. And this is a two minute resting state uh, anal analysis of signals. Uh, the first day of implantation before medication wean, before any seizures, 
can be done very quickly. And what we saw across a number of patients is that this connectivity measure can consistently and accurately uh, reflect the regions that uh, are likely to create seizures. And what you can do is we can create these connectivity maps where the size of the sphere represents the, the, the magnitude of connectivity of that region and the size of the lines connecting the spheres, the magnitude of connectivity connecting those regions. And we can visualize in this patient, for example, who had seizures onset in the hippocampus and amygdala, just how high the connectivity is there. And we can use maps like this to help guide our surgical decisions in addition to the standard clinical interpretation. The directionality of this connectivity is very interesting. Um, a project that Graham Johnson's working on now, showing that this is a connectivity of seizure onset zones, propagation zones where seizures spread to, and then it, re, brain regions not involved in, um, in seizures. This is inward connectivity, connectivity into the, the brain region, and this is distance. First of all, you can see connectivity dissipates with distance across all types of brain regions, which makes sense nearby regions are more closely connected, but you can see very high connectivity in the seizure onset zones, moderate kind of increased connectivity in the propagative zones and low connectivity uh, in the uninvolved zones for the inward connections. However, the opposite we see in the outward connections. Here it's flipped. The, the seizure onset zones have very low outward connectivity and it's actually the non-involved zones that have the highest outward connectivity. It seems counterintuitive. Why does a seizure onset zone that create seizures have very high inward connectivity, but low outward connectivity. What we're, what we're believe is that at the resting state, there's probably a lot of inward inhibitory connections that are trying to suppress seizure onset and they therefore inhibit the outward connections, but probably when a seizure onset occurs, that relationship flips. And I'll show you that a little bit more in a second. These directionality maps can help us also visualize the seizure network and to help us localize where seizures are coming from. Here, the thickness of the line between these brain regions indicates the magnitude of connectivity between them and the, the arrow indicates the direction. In this patient with bilateral hippocampal seizures, you can see very high inward connections to both hippocampi and just visualizing this connectivity map can help us guide surgical decisions. Similar in this patient who had seizures coming from the right frontal lobe, including inferior and middle frontal gyrus, very high connectivity inward to these regions. And again, this is just from a very brief two minute resting state data sample. We've looked at these measures over time in this study by resident uh, Danica um, Paulo and research assistant Kristen Wills. The connectivity of these of seizure onset zones is consistent throughout several days of the EMU. Even, however, you know, the medications change throughout those days. So one question is, does medication influence the connectivity over time? If we reorder these days specifically with the medication load of the patient during their wean and from high medication load to low medication load throughout their EMU stay, we do actually see some influence such that here is an example of imaginary coherence. The, the uh, epileptogenic zone connectivity trends downward with de decreased medications, whereas the non-epileptogenic zone trends upward, showing that some of these connections uh, can actually be changed with, um, with, with medication loads. And so it's an important thing to keep in mind because, because these anti-epileptic medications are powerful medications that influence brain connections. And so it's something we need to pay attention to when we're interpreting these connectivity studies. We are also doing cortical, cortical evoked potential studies in, so in addition to in that first day, when we are doing this analysis, we can stimulate different brain regions and see how the, the responses in the other brain regions are. And, the, and um, again, doing both data-driven and machine learning approaches. This is a data, this is a data-driven machine learning approach seen when, when, if we analyze all the different electrodes in the brain and we, when we stimulate that electrode, how do, do all of the other, um, signals respond throughout the other electrodes. And we can find very characteristic connectivity patterns, um, effective connectivity that, that help distinguish regions that ultimately will create seizures from those that won't create seizures with a very high sensitivity and specificity. Specifically, if we look at the 900 milliseconds after a, a pulse, uh, it's really the first 300 milliseconds that we see a very characteristic response when we stimulate regions that ultimately are epileptogenic and those that aren't epileptogenic. So our, our hypothesis is that at the 
it interictal resting state, there's very high inhibitory connections from non-epileptogenic regions to epileptogenic regions, but that flips when the seizure starts and excitatory connections from the epileptogenic region begin to overwhelm this, the, the network. And uh, we can look at that further with, with the cortical, cortical evoked potential, as I mentioned. And what we're seeing is supports the hypothesis is that when you stimulate epileptogenic regions, um, it, you have high excitatory output and that you're to, detected in other non-epileptogenic regions. And the, the vice versa, when you stimulate non-epileptogenic regions, you see inhibition of certain uh, rep power bands in epileptogenic regions. So what we're trying to create here is a connectivity map using both resting state connections and stimulated connections that can be gathered in a short state in a short term um, recording period and help us improve our decision making by by determining which nodes in this network are going to create seizures and need to be treated and by combining these different measures into uh, logistic regression maps we can create a connectivity profile that tells us yes this region is likely to create seizures and does need to be treated. This region is not likely to create seizures and does, likely does not need to be treated. So if we think the seizures are coming from there based on other data, we really need to step back before we proceed with surgery because the connectivity profile may be telling us something different. The next thing I wanna talk about is it's temporal lobe epilepsy is interesting because the seizures come from the temporal lobe, but the effects of the, the epilepsy extend beyond the temporal lobe. Why do patients lose consciousness during most co temporal lobe complex partial seizures? It, this temporal lobe is not necessary for consciousness. And why do neurocognitive deficits, such as attention, executive function, concentration, that these patients develop extend far beyond uh, the temporal lobe? Diffuse gray matter atrophy, diffuse cortical metabolism problems. Why does focal epilepsy lead to more global brain problems? Uh, we're finding out that it's really, uh, important that the role of subcortical brain networks, subcortical arousal structures, such as brain stem, basal forebrain, and thalamus, that we don't often think about as seizures onset zones are actually very important in leading to the pathophysiology of epilepsy. When a patient has this, this temporal lobe complex partial seizure, spike activity spreads throughout temporal lobe electrodes in this intracranial EEG recording. But then what you see in the frontal parietal cortex is the, a, a large amplitude sleep-like rhythm. So even though the seizure in a complex partial seizure doesn't spread to the frontal and parietal lobes, the frontal parietal lobes seem to go to sleep. And what our hypothesis is, which is built upon the Hal Blumenfeld work at Yale, where I did my PhD, is that normal subcortical structures that keep the cortex awake, uh, seizure activity in the mesial temporal lobe may spread to those subcortical structures, even though they don't spread to the rest of the cortex, then those normal uh, excitatory signals go away during, during the seizure. A uh, patient recovers after the seizure, wakes up, starts responding again. But if this happens over and over throughout a patient's life, they develop, in our, in our hypothesis, chronic connectivity problems between the subcortical structures and the cortex. And that leads to, to cognitive problems beyond the temporal lobe. Uh, but we think that we may be able to actually par partially reverse this process if we can stop the seizures with surgery and get them back to a more normal connectivity profile. This was an MEG connectivity study of MTLE patients versus controls, supporting our hypothesis that the longer, the longer they had epilepsy and the higher frequency of consciousness and parent seizures, the more they had decreases in connectivity in their frontal and parietal cortices and in subcortical areas such as thalamus and brain and basal forebrain. So su supporting our hypothesis that as they're they continue to have seizures, they're having long-term connectivity problems between subcortical structures and the cortex, including brainstem, a, a, a tic, a reticular activating system, basal forebrain structures. And these are some fMRI studies that we're doing. This is an fMRI study of 40 patients controls versus patients showing um, the patients, the purple is T-tests, decreased connectivity between brainstem regions and the cortex. So the longer these patients have seizures and the more frequent consciousness and pairing, they are having specifically decreased functional connections seen on MRI between brainstem and the cortex. These excitatory connections that keep our cortex awake and keep our normal cognitive state are getting impaired. Uh, we've also done um, a little bit more advanced network statistics. This is um, a, a analysis done by Hernan Gonzalez showing of all the nodes in the brain, when we do a network-based statistic, the one subcortical structure called the nucleus basalis of Maynard 
is actually just as abnormal as the hippocampus and amygdala in mesial temporal lobe epilepsy. It's a very underappreciated thing that these subcortical structures have connectivity problems and that it can be that are um, underappreciated in epilepsy. And who cares about the subcortical connectivity? Well, the, these cognitivity issues are quantitatively related to the progressive cognitive problems that these patients have. Attention and concentration, cognitive processing, executive function get worse and worse as connectivity between the subcortical structures and the cortex continue. What about if you do surgery and you're able to achieve seizure freedom? We did a study where we looked at patients three, on average three years after epilepsy surgery. And so these purple maps of decreased connectivity between brainstem and patients that we saw in patients versus controls actually reversed three years after surgery when we, when we were able to achieve seizure freedom. In patients who were seizure free, even though their structural connections between subcortex and cortex did not improve, their functional connections improved that they were no longer distinguishable from healthy controls. So we can actually improve the functional networks of our patients with neurosurgical procedures that, um, that can stop their seizures. So to conclude, you know, our main points here are Connectivity patterns from MRI can help improve localization non-invasively. And so what's our big picture is one day localization without requiring intracranial EEG or at a minimum improved SEG targeting to help us better plan our electrode implants. And even our intracranial EEG connectivity analysis can help us identify epileptogenic regions even beyond our, our standard clinical interpretation. So a big picture goal there is, can SEEG, when it's necessary, one day be an outpatient procedure, perhaps a one-day procedure without having to wean medications, but our, our network analyses can be used to determine where seizures come from and, what, and which brain regions need to be treated. And I think it's also interesting to be that we're using connectivity studies to help understand their neurocognitive problems in epilepsy better. Specifically, the subcortical arousal structures are very important to, to this, even though it's not something that we typically think about in epilepsy or even when we think about neurocognitive deficits. These connectivity metrics should enter the clinical pipeline. And um, I, have, I just recently was fortunate to start a four-year term as director of the Surgical Therapies Commission for the International League Against Epilepsy. And one of the first things that I did was create a task force to, of uh, experts around the world to help us come up with a, a map of how we can start to better get these connectivity studies into the preclinical pipeline. Which ones are working the best? Which ones can be disseminated across centers the best? And how can we start to improve our surgical care of epilepsy using an engineering approach? So I've got a lot of people to thank, several students and trainees in the lab who have been very helpful, uh, collaborators across Vanderbilt and other centers, Vicki Morgan and Katie Chang are two engineers that are some of my closest collaborators. Um, and I would, again, really appreciate you having me here today, and it's been an honor. So thank you so much for the invitation. Amazing work, that you amazing work. I know that Sanjit already has some of our colleagues right here getting ready to show some, uh, ask you some questions. But Sanjit, before we finish, let me show something, you know, on the, uh, before we go to the questions, I want to share with you something. Let me see if I can do it right here. If I can uh, find it, hold on one second. For some reason. Yes, there you go. Here we go. I just found it. Let me see if I can show it to you guys. Can you see that, Sanji? Yeah, we got it. You got it. All right. So I want people to, because I put it on the chat, but I want you to understand this body of work is a body of work that began with an F30 when he, when the, Dr. Engel was a graduate student, he got an F30. Then he finished MDPAC, he went to UCSF, got an F32 which I would say probably about 80% of us who attended UCS have got, you know, through other careers. And that's what set us up with a lot of us with NIH funding. Then he moved on to get a K99 and then ROO, which is a transition, and then moved on to two R01s, which is currently what he's working with. So amazing, amazing body of work. And this is why I tell the residents, and you're going to be meeting with them in a little bit, that, you, to, that it's not like, we're bougie when we're talking about NIH work. Is that because you're willing to put your work 
with a group of very, very talented people to be peer review and they trash you many times. And what people don't see is the fact that there are probably hundreds of these that have not gotten funded. You know, people only see the ones that are funded, but there's a lot of them that never get funded. So congratulations, beautiful, beautiful work. So I leave it up to now Sanjit for some questions. Take it away, Sanjit. Yeah, Dario, what a wonderful talk. You know, it's it's always humbling to me when we do these epilepsy talks or we hear these epilepsy talks and we say, look, we're great. We can cure seizures in 50% of people, you know, and it's it's how do we make it better? And I think it's really amicable to see your approach to trying to make it better. Uh, we have a lot of questions. So I'm going to start with Bill, uh, who's our director of epilepsy. Hey, Sanjeet, I'm here. Thank you so much. Uh, Dario, that was an amazing talk. Such wonderful work that you're doing with. Thank the, you so much. Thank you. Um, I, I'm 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 very interested in the uh, connectivity maps that you've you've developed. Uh, how do you think this is going to influence uh, the areas of resection in the future and or neuromodulation? I know you've written a lot on both topics, mm -hmm. but in the network concept. There is not a single node that's uh, uh, involved. Uh, what do you think about um, some of the case reports that we're now seeing where there's multiple sites in a network that are either ablated and or stimulate? What's your thoughts on that? I think yeah, epilepsy, even clearly focal epilepsy is a network disorder. So that's a great question. And thank you, Bill. You know, um, sometimes we can identify key nodes that if you remove them, the seizures will stop because they're very important nodes. And sometimes we're missing certain nodes when we do our resection and we need to extend it larger or we're, we're, we, or we're realizing that the seizures are coming from other areas that we didn't predict. And I think when seizures are coming from multiple, when the network is too altered, there are certain epilepsies that will not become seizure free with resection. They're, they're diffuse, the network is, is altered beyond the ability to stop them with just resecting a few nodes. And those are the patients that we need to then think about neuromodulation approaches and, uh, and I think these network analysis will help us not only improve our planning for the resection, but which nodes need to be stimulated uh, for, for with our neuromodulation approaches. Because that's also, you know, obviously a, a challenging question right now. Yes, I, I, and follow up too, you showed some nice work relative to early surgery, limiting not only some of the network um, aggravation, but probably presumably also comorbidities. What are your thoughts about early surgery in patients that have uh, lesions and no lesions? What do you think about that? Well, you know, we now have randomized control evidence from uh, Engel et al that um, surgery within two years of patients with mesial temporal epilepsy uh, do, very, do very well. And, I, and we have clear evidence that despite all the new medications that we've been introduced, Patients who have failed two to three medications will not go on to be seizure-free for the, in the vast majority of cases. I think obviously there's risks to surgery, so those need to be taken care carefully uh, considered, but we're seeing the progressive network alterations that are deleterious in the brain with seizures over time. They lead to, pro they lead to problems that um, some of them can be recovered when you stop the seizures, but not all of them can be. So I think when you clearly diagnose a patient who's with more than two or more than a year of seizures, failed to well tolerated medications, then I think an expedited seizure uh, surgery workup is uh, is warranted. Even if it doesn't end up with with a with a resection, if the patient's not a good candidate, we really need to find out earlier what what how we can best stop these progressive network disturbances. Uh, thank you. I'm going to ask Dr. Blackman to come and she has a few uh, questions regarding your work with connectivity and cognition. Uh, and from my standpoint, have you started doing anything with sampling some of these subcortical structures, for example, the you know, nucleus of Meinart uh, in your stereo cases to see if we can alter some of that connectivity with STEM? It's a, it's a big missing piece of the puzzle. The answer is no. And, and obviously, before we start to change our clinical pipeline, we really want to be sure. And I think we are at this, we are at the um, phase where I think it, it would be worth studying. I don't think we have enough data, though, for, for to clinically justify putting electrodes in nucleus basalis or in the brainstem. So I think it would have to be a clinical trial. But I certainly think it, we have you know, enough, um, enough data to, to warrant that. Uh, but it's not something we've done yet. 
Well, we'll talk about it further. It sounds exciting. Yeah. Yes, yes, we do put them in the thalamus, though, and other key that's true. in the arousal network. And that's, um, we have this opportunity to study patients post DBS um, of the anterior nucleus of the thalamus and the central median nucleus and to look at change in this network configurations over time with, you know, experience sampling neuropsychology methods, which I, um, at the big, so I'm a neuropsychologist and I especially appreciated this talk and your focus on the cognitive comorbidities, which can often be just as disruptive and disturbing to patients after surgery as the uh, seizure outcomes. So I really paid attention and careful attention because I, I think your data is fascinating. And um, there's so much potential to study patients who are already getting DBS, understand the trajectory of change in their arousal networks, their cognition and seizure control over time. So, um, you know, we, we certainly have to have hypothesis driven studies for future pr prospective research, but while we're doing these patients or studying these patients clinically, I think we, we would benefit from thinking critically about how to study those, those um, the natural course of network change after DBS, especially in arousal networks. Yes, I completely agree. And thank you for the points. And uh, I think, you know, functional, functional connectivity studies with inpatients on and off stimulation will also be important to help us understand, you know, how, how are the networks being affected since we can't put electrodes everywhere, but, but we have improving, you know, non-invasive functional measures with our, with our MRI that despite the challenges of doing it during stimulation, I think it's a, a barrier we need to overcome. Is Dr. Meadowbrooks on the call? He's done such beautiful work in looking at on and off stimulation and anterior nucleus of the thalamus. Yeah, yeah, Eric's not. Unfortunately, he's scheduling something with the astronaut project or something he's working on. I was trying to get him on because uh, I know he'd love to talk to you. Uh, but yeah, you, you know, there are challenges with on and off stim for sure, uh, especially kind of syncing that to your fMRI data and, and some of the subtleties of that that we've had to work through. Uh, but I think that's the future for sure. I know Dr. Faisa raised his hand for a question as well. Yeah, so Dario, uh, excellent talk. You know, I remember you you giving a talk at the AS uh, back in 2016. And, you know, the career trajectory you've made, it's quite impressive. And now, regarding to your current work, you know, I was interested to hear if you guys have already applied some of the connectivity data to, to your patients at the Eplip Surgical Conference. Do you include those uh, for recommendation in terms of truly like, you know, transitioning into a clinical practice. Well, thank you for the kind comments. I really appreciate that. We, we are, where, where it's, we've begun to is by applying some of these connectivity models in some of our patients and where we're planning to go forward with surgery and taking a step back uh, based on some of the results, perhaps reconsidering whether to do stereo EEG or reconsidering the resection that we have planned that, to look at the data more closely. It's, it's a small, components right now because obviously we are not tried and true tested we don't we are not externally validated we need large that's one reason what's one of our goals in creating this ILE ILAE task force is be, we need to to figure out ways to share our data better externally val validate our data so i think we have to be very cautious it before when we, you know as we start to apply these these um results to affect our clinical decisions so we're starting to, it's early, but we, we have a lot of ground to cover before we can, before we can do this reliably. Yeah, no, no, I agree. I think that's my, you know, worry, my other worry, because it's maybe just to, some of these are just maybe noises and Correct. we really don't want to, you know, preemptively act on them. Thank you again. Great talk. Thank you. All right. We're going to wrap up here. We're five minutes over. I know we could uh, probably talk to you for another hour. Uh, so I appreciate <laughs> you spending this morning with us. And I appreciate the teams that are going to be meeting with you later today. I know the residents Great. are going to be meeting with you, uh, myself, Dr. Chen, some of the faculty as well uh, a little bit later. I'm going to have Andres come up. He's going to share a little gift we got uh, for you, and hopefully we'll be sending over your way soon. Yeah, so uh, we are, um, you know, uh, we, we would like to thank you for joining us this morning and giving your talk. So we are sending over this plaque uh, that you should receive uh, soonish in, you know, in appreciation for you spending your morning with us. Thank oh, you. Th th it's a great honor to be here. They, that's you know, very much appreciated. It's thank you to, to the team. This has been great to, to be with you, albeit virtually.
and hope to see you in person soon at, at meetings. And this flag is an, an appreciation of you spending the morning with us and also in recognition of the tremendous amount of a lifetime of dedication and commitment and nights after nights of staying up, not only taking care of your patients, but also writing the grants, thinking about the science, leading your team, you know, and all the things that you're doing so extraordinarily naturally and uh, almost seems effortlessly, but we are, we understand that it's a tremendous amount of work. So thank you, Daddy. and I'll see you in about 9 a.m. Thank you, Alfredo. Yes, and coming from such a leader and a pioneer in the field as you, it really means so much. Thank you. Very good. All right, everyone, let's day. get on with the days. Thank you again. <laughs> and the residents are going to be meeting with you that you are that I don't know if Andres said it. Same, yes. Same link? So it's it's uh, the second link that we yes. sent, and that's yes. the same link okay. for all meetings. Great. Up on and off. Good. Everyone. Will do. Thank all you right. so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. You got it. <laughs>